How does it work? We're measuring and observing biocommunication. So how does that work in the testing process? How does it work in your body? How is it that, that we can take a, an herb here in Hawaii and ask your body what it thinks of that? Well, it's my conclusion from working with this process is that it's the light information that's carrying the signal. When we take a, a, a sample of a remedy and we put it, we call it in the circuit, it's really uh, in, in contact or close to within a centimeter of, of uh, a metal uh, plate, a metal plate that's in conduction that's plugged in to the, this, think of it as an antenna. If it's connected to the body now, that, well, that's an antenna to the body. So whatever is in proximity to the antenna <clears throat> acts, the body receives that as if it's in its field. It's part of the, the body's field. And then if I'm connected non-locally through my thoughts, through my consciousness to you at a distance, now I'm an antenna to you and your body gets the signal through my body and responds, I get the response through my body from your body of how this is working. And that can be done electronically. Uh, I do it through muscle testing. So after eight years of, of measuring on patients, uh, I was able to feel, it's like training wheels. I didn't need the training wheels. I could actually feel it faster than I could measure it. And having to uh, move each thing, now I can move my body and use my body as an antenna and feel the responses to the different uh, substances, which are, uh, we use substances that represent parts of the body. Just pull out one of our many boxes of samples. So these are, are, are vials that contain, usually in a saline base, uh, some could be an alcohol base, but a sealed vial of a sample, could be homeopathically prepared, or here's one that's iron filings, some sort of substance that carries, uh, gives off a signal that we're going to use basically as the language of the body. This is the energetic biocommunication language of the body. So the one I happened to pick up is for the palatine tonsil, one of the five uh, pairs of tonsils in the tonsillar ring. And uh, fortunately, there's only two of them that surgeons can reach, so they, <laughs> they leave you with at least three sets. But uh, the, the immune system... Uh, has, has almost been considered vestigial and, and, and a mistake by modern medicine, you know, using uh, medications to suppress immunity, things like uh, strong steroid uh, types of treatments that, that suppress immunity, uh, surgery to remove the, the spleen, the, the appendix, the tonsils, these are all immune organs. Uh, but really, uh, all the, all the organs are important. You don't find too many people with excess organs, just like you can't really have a deficiency of, of uh, toxic pharmaceuticals. So the solutions to balancing whatever if we find a stress pattern, let's say we find a stress pattern related to tonsil, this is actually a D4 homeopathic potency. So if we looked in a microscope at a fourth dilution of a 10 to 1 dilution, we'd find, oh, there's one part per, uh, per 10,000, uh, there's actual cell, cellular material in there from, from tonsils, in this case from biodynamically raised cows. So that's where the signal comes from <coughs> of this language of the body. These are the words, different parts of, different parts, because each tissue, while every cell in, in all the tissues has the same <coughs> genes, different genes are turned on and off in that cellular environment, and that's how one tissue is different in structure and function from the others. So if that's a stress, then we can look for remedies. We might think, oh, maybe N-acetylcysteine, an amino acid that liquefies the lymph and helps it flow through the tonsils, which are filters for the lymph. And we can, we can uh, confirm or deny that hypothesis. Uh, so it's really a scientific method of observation, of hypothesis, and, and uh, where we can prove, prove it true or not true. Uh, many times, and that's why in European medicine, where this comes from, they say that doctors who practice 
this kind of biological medicine where you're testing real-time responses of the body. In one year, they'll get the equivalent, <coughs> equivalent experience of, of standard medicine gets, a uh, doctor gets in 10 years because in standard medicine, what do you do? You, you take some measurements, you make some observations, you look at the pattern, you say, hmm, here's what I think is happening and here's what I think will work. So you're using the intellect, which we know is 1% of, less than 1% of the information processing going on in the doctor's body and your body. And we're using that less than 1% to, to judge and evaluate and discern what the proper treatment will be. And then give it to the patient, and maybe in a month or two or three months, we'll get feedback about how that worked. Where with biocommunication, we might have, we might have to reject nine out of 10 hypotheses, or 99 out of 100, to find that one that actually works, and we're identifying it in real time. Before you leave the doctor's office, you're finding out what's working then you can actually go home and put them in your body. So it's a much faster process, much more feedback, and that's how we learn, is with that kind of feedback. So both for the doctor and the patient, it's a, it's a, it speeds up the process for the doctor for learning how to treat uh, people and help them heal, and for the patient to heal faster. So besides the location, the, the where is it, where is the stress in the body? We can also identify what is that stress? What kind of stress? Uh, classically, these were called pretests because they we test them first before the location. It just tells us the testing sequence. What are they? Is they're, they're different substances that relate to specific stress patterns. Not necessarily telling us where in the body, but uh, a fatty acid imbalance or uh, some type of viral stress or fungal stress. So. I've got them organized in my system based on the five phases, which uh, we cover in, in a couple of the DVDs, the five phases of, of, of disease and healing, uh, where this comes out of bioelectronics of Vincent, which is uh, originated in France. Vincent was hired by the, the nation to, to uh, evaluate the water systems. And this is getting up there close to 100 years ago, uh, not quite that long, maybe 80 years ago, uh, but back when, before we had, uh, you know, chlorinated waters, so there were surface waters that were polluted in some communities, and people would be sick from that, and different types of waters, people would get different types of diseases, but uh, that wasn't known until Vincent did his work, where he measured the physics of, the, of each type of water, the, the basically how, how I interpret it, the, 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 the electrons, the photons, light, energy, and, and protons is what he was looking at. You know, we use different terms in different sciences to, to describe that. But uh, uh, the, the hydrogen, they were looking at hydrogen potential, which is a measure of the electrons forming hydrogen atoms and molecules. The, the uh, uh, protons, of course, is pH. We use the same terminology on that in, in many sciences the potential hydrogen, which is the hydrogen ion potential, not the hydrogen molecular potential that measures the electrons. Because a proton is the nucleus of a hydrogen atom. A proton and an electron is a hydrogen atom. When they're ionized, now you have a proton and you have an electron. And so the measure of electrons that they use is RH2, the hydrogen molecular potential. Because when you form a hydrogen atom, two of those come together and form a stable molecule. And then light, they're measuring uh, conductivity. Because why? Light is absorbed by electrons, and the electrons then ionize, and then they, those, those charged ions can carry electricity in a fluid medium. And this is actually, in science, the, the, uh, measuring the energy, these three different types of energy, in a liquid medium, like in a biological system. And those three determine the energy in microwatts in that biological fluid. So this is, again, the science of BEV, or bioelectronics of Vincent in Europe. They've studied hundreds of thousands of patients over the years as they, watching them get sick, watching them heal. And in that process, they, there's a, a definite pattern, and there's a lot of variability, individual variability, but that overall pattern is a helpful roadmap to healing. To understand the, the the five phases, the way I've organized it is so that you can look at it as the person doing the healing and have know where you're at and where you're going, and and again have a roadmap for healing. So 
from phase one being the lowest level of health, lowest energy level, phase five being the highest, most, most balanced high energy level. Uh, and so we go into that in more detail, but basically in low energy terrain we have viral conditions. A cell with low energy doesn't have structured water around it. And this is a whole other aspect of you know, the last 10 years learning uh, in, in science about more how water works. Water is an amazing substance. It's, it's considered you know, over 99% of the molecules in your body, uh, although technically when that water, it, when our body's healthy, that water structures itself to where it's not separate molecules of water. It's actually not even water in the sense of H2O. It's a different phase, uh, different, different state of matter that I call liquid crystal. Uh, the, the researchers, leading researchers, are calling it easy water for exclusion zone water. Just like how when ice forms uh, on, on the ocean, you know, in the Arctic, there's, there's ice. That, that ice is not salty. It excludes the salt when it forms ice. The crystal has no space in it for, for sodium and chloride and those kind of ions. It's, so it forms an exclusion zone, and it does that in the liquid crystal state before it forms ice. So it's an intermediate uh, state uh, of, of water, but technically not H2O, because it's not only, only excluding the salt and any other uh, materials, any toxins, wastes in the body will be excluded from this, this structured water. Uh, it's also excluding a lot of protons, so hydrogen nuclei, pr protons, acidity, is being excluded, leaving an alkaline state in the healthy structured water of the body. So it's, it's, it's a fascinating new piece of information that, that we plug into our clinical theory of everything. But it's very, very important to understand how, for example, water in the H2O bulk, just separate molecules of water, doesn't absorb UV or infrared. And yet the structured water in the body does absorb those. And when it absorbs that energy, that quantum energy, it actually structures itself more. And it does so by separating protons out, which means there's a charge separation. Well, that's what a battery is. This is a biological battery we didn't know about when I went to doctor school. And I, I'll bet you they're not still even yet teaching it <laughs> in most professional programs. But yet to understand health, this is a piece of the puzzle that helps, has helped me to understand and to, to, to model what's actually going on in health and disease. So in, in a low energy state, bottom line is, you've got your cell, right? You've got a cell that's alive, like in, in, in the laboratory. If the, if the laboratory at the hospital wants to culture a virus from your body, I bet you they're not even going to do it. It's not easy. Why? They need a special growth medium, like talking about Vince, uh, about... Uh, Béchamp and his debate with Pasteur, Béchamp said, it's the terrain. Well, if you work in a, as a lab technician, you know that. Because if you're trying to culture a virus in a medium for growing fungi or a medium for growing bacteria, you're <laughs> not going to get any results. It doesn't grow there. It needs attenuated cells, what they call it in the laboratory. They need low-energy cells that don't have this these layers, millions, literally millions of layers of structured water that, that exclude particles like viruses, that exclude even salt, sodium chloride. We think of our body as a salty medium like the ocean, but it actually has, has these exclusion zones where there's healthy energetic water that's holding a battery charge of energy that's useful physiologically to the cells and also keeps viruses from being able to attach to the cell membrane. So why is it that before you get a, a cold, you feel low energy? Well, if you didn't have the low energy, the cold couldn't even happen. Uh, so that's low energy terrain. That's where we have degenerative processes. So there's not enough energy to run the cell, to repair the cell. And, uh, and that's where we see cancer in the very low energy terrain. And we all have cancer cells. You know, 90, over 90% of men in their 30s, based on autopsy of, of men in car accidents, have prostate cancer cells. So, but yet that's not what they would die of if they lived to their 80s uh, in most cases. So very few people actually die of cancer. Most cancer patients die of one of three things, liver failure, kidney failure, or malnutrition. 
So uh, those are really what, what you need to treat to live longer and healthier. There was a meta-analysis of cancer studies done, looked at all the research worldwide on cancer, and the people who did the best, yeah, the people who, did, who lived the longest were actually the controls. The people who didn't do radiation, chemotherapy, or surgery, but were just observed for, for comparison. So your body is actually not trying to kill itself with autoimmune diseases or cancer or degenerative diseases. It's actually doing the best it can with the materials, the energy, and the information it has at hand to keep itself, keep you functioning, doing the things that you're trying to do in life. So the pretests are uh, are these information signals that relate to specific types of stress patterns. This one that I happen to pick up is uh, homeopathic causticum D30. That's an indicator that tells us there's a recent irritation pattern in the system. So they give us clues. And, and just as the organ stresses give us clues for location, these give us clues about what kind of stress is happening. And we can cross-correlate these. We can relate them together and say, oh, that recent irritation is affecting the pancreas. Ah, okay. Now we have more information. So we begin to build up a picture of the cause and effect chains happening, and we can look at the beginning of the causal chain, where the stress is coming from, and balance that, and that balances the rest that are at the effect of that. And usually the symptoms are at the effect end, not at the cause end. So that's the tricky part about, you know, a conventional approach of treating symptoms. Here's the symptoms. And when, when we measure, even if we measure blood pressure, that's probably a symptom. How often is blood pressure a cause? Well, it's, it's something that your heart is doing and your vascular system is doing to respond to conditions in the body, usually in the kidney, because that's the high pressure filter for the blood to clean the blood. So it's getting a signal saying, hey, there's this issue, maybe there's heavy metals stuck in the kidneys, we're having a hard time pushing these marbles through the sieve, and so give us more pressure. Okay, and the heart's giving more pressure. And what the medications do is, ooh, chill out, heart, don't work so hard, you're over, you know, you're working really hard, it has a reason, and we're not solving the reason, we're just forcing it to stop working as well. And uh, that's why the one study that looked at the big picture in hypertension, it was done in England, they asked the patients, the family, and people in the community, is this person healthier before or after they started taking the antihypertensive drugs? And, and there was a very high correlation, very high agreement between all, all those observers that people were not as well, not as healthy, not as functional after taking antihypertensive medications, where all the physicians in, in the study were in a high correlation agreement that the person was healthier. Why? Because they're measuring the blood pressure. And they're not really looking at detoxification and kidney function and the, 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 the big picture of the person. You won't go in the doctor, they measure your height, weight, and blood pressure. And so they're looking at particular uh, observations. They're, they're important. They're real observations. Nothing wrong with measuring the blood pressure. It's non-invasive, great information, but is it telling you what's happening in the body? Well, there's millions of chemical reactions going on in the body, so even if you measure blood chemistry, if you measure a, a SMAC test, uh, you know, uh, 24 different measurements, is that a complete picture? The only, thing, the only way we can really get a complete picture of what's going on in the body is at an energetic and informational level. If we measure the energy field, that's a summation of all the energetic interactions, which every chemical reaction is an energetic exchange. It's a change in the energy level of an electron. Electrons form and, form and break bonds between different minerals. And that's how the body builds its chemistry and how it changes the chemistry. So the energy field is, is uh, an overview. And now with this type of, of signaling, we can zero in on what particular patterns are happening to build up that overall uh, biofield, body energy field. There's, there's another part of this test that relates to uh, a general, what's called a biological score index, a biological age, they called it initially, it's really not a, a great term for it. You know, a lot of times the names we put on things, we have an idea of what it is, but uh, describing it more accurately is more helpful. So 
so we don't call it a biological age anymore. But this is something that it can go up and down, and, and certainly affects is related to aging. But aging isn't about time; it's about the processes going on in the body. Processes like oxidation, processes like glycation, where sugar attaches to molecules and makes them dysfunctional. So, but this is a, a, a measure of the connective tissue that came from uh, research where they would inject a series of, of homeopathic different potencies of connective tissue, or mesenchyme, on the skin and watch for which ones would form a wheel, a bump, a reaction. And then eventually the doctors doing the electrodermal testing found they could use those same, that same test and adapt it in a less invasive way, not having to inject in the skin, but just measuring electronically the body's response at the different frequencies, different potencies, which are equivalent to frequency. Kind of like different, different radio stations. Right? I like to say it's, it's like a piano keyboard and, and, and looking at which notes are out of tune. The higher notes have a higher pitch and a higher energy, quantum energy. The lower notes, lower pitch, lower quantum energy. So if it's a high frequency, high potency that's, that's out of tune, that's saying it's equivalent to a higher toxicity or a higher stress level. So we want to reduce that stress find out what it is that's stressed, where the stress is, what it, where it's coming from, what balances that, and help the body work at a minimum stress level. And that won't work forever, but we find for about a month that'll work, and then the body will complete its balancing process, its healing process, and then we can identify what's next. Your body will actually identify, self-identify. What's the next priority for healing? And then we can complete, uh, repeat the process.